The sons of Ferris Manus are cold, calculating and logical, suppressing their emotions to avoid the fate of their dead Primarch. Though organised according to the Codex Astartes, the Iron Hands chapters still maintain many traditions of their homeworld Medusa, including their clan companies. Named after their supposed primogenitor tribes for humanity on Medusa, the clan companies were intended to remind the Iron Hands of the mortal men they had once been. And though the message has been somewhat forgotten without Manus around, each company still maintains unique traits and qualities. Whilst the first company, the Averni, is probably the best known, there is one company who are more emotionally charged than their brothers. This third clan company have been at the centre of some of the greatest failures and successes for the Iron Hands, and it is perhaps in them that the future of the mental state of the chapter lies. Once led by the legendary traditionalist Iron Father Christos, and now under the command of Iron Captain Sind Grolvok, they are Clan Rokan. This is their story, looking at what we know of their origins and their role in recent history. My name is Michael for Tactica Imperialis, and welcome to 40k Stories. Following the Horus Heresy and the death of Ferris Manus at the hands of Fulgrim, the Iron Hands Legion gathered on their homeworld of Medusa to debate their future. This was around the time of the announcement of the Codex Astartes by Robert Gilliman, and from this event known as the Tempering, the first successors of the Legion were founded. Along with this, a great debate was held on the path the Sons of Manus would take in the coming centuries, led by the Iron Council that had been founded to lead them in the absence of the Primarch. The Iron Hands were angry, driven by vengeance against the traitor legions, but they came to realise that this rage could not be unleashed. It was Manus's blind rage that had caused him to keep advancing, despite the urgings of Korax and Vulcan to fall back on Istvan V, that had seen the Iron Hands encircled and massacred whilst the Primarch was killed by Fulgrim, and his surviving sons knew that to give in to their hatred would see them succumb to the same fate. Instead, logic became the defining trait of the former 10th Legion, with emotion being suppressed in favour of discipline and strength. With the ties between the Adeptus Mechanicus and the Chapter now stronger than ever, you would be forgiven for thinking that sentimentality or traditionalism would be abandoned in the face of this new doctrine. And yet something survived. When the Legion was organised, rather than simply naming their companies as First, Second Company, etc., the old names of the clan companies were maintained, with the most powerful of tribes reserved for the parent chapter. The Third Company became known as Clan Rokan, a seemingly aggressive and piratical tribe of old Medusa, and despite there being no logical explanation for it, it seems that the members of this company share in that aggression. This is because the old clan traditions are for some reason maintained in the companies, with company members being adopted into that company's clan for the duration of their service. In the centuries and millennia following the tempering, Clan Rokan were often at the forefront of the Iron Hands campaigns. Though I do not have access to the records themselves, it is believed that Rokan in fact saw the most action of all the clan companies, though as a mixed battle company, I would not be surprised if this were true. I'm also assuming in this that the single squad deployments of clans Averni and Dorvok, the first and tenth companies, in support roles or in single squad deployments as I said, aren't counted in that calculation. We do not know many battles that they fought in over the past few millennia, at least not until more recent times. However, in late M31, an engagement took place that, while seemingly insignificant in itself, introduced a threat that would manifest again in future, the demon known as the Sapphire King. This demon was said to have been birthed when Ferris Manus died, formed on the psychic wave of the Gorgon's emotions, and it fed on the feelings the Iron Hands had suppressed during the tempering, which meant it got very powerful, very fast. The battles in question were fought in a region known as the Ometrican Reach, though the time between arrival and engagement was rather long, as the scouts of Clan Dorvok needed to locate the enemy strongholds across multiple worlds. Eventually, they found fleshy monuments on the swamp world Pulis, giving the first indication of Slaneshi corruption. In characteristic fashion, the Iron Hands took the simplest and most effective route to uprooting this corruption. Genocide. Six years later, and the system was, presumably, empty. But the Sapphire King the cultists claimed to be worshipping had not reared its head. Rather, the demon was content to grow in power and wait for the perfect moment to corrupt and destroy the Sons of Manus. Of course, Rokan and co. knew nothing of this, and they simply carried on as they were. They fought in many campaigns against a variety of the Imperium's foes, and Rokan itself was notable for standing 100% loyal during a Mechanicus civil war known as the Moiré Schism in M35. 
It is not stated what the Moiré doctrines entailed or why they would have affected the Iron Hands in such a way, but it is known that members of some clan companies did stand with the rebels, but not Rokan. The leaders of the clan will have undoubtedly changed many times over the millennia, as Iron Fathers are killed and replaced. But in M40, it was a tech marine, Iron Father Darmos, who is in overall command. We know this sadly for all the wrong reasons, as it was during Darmos's command that the Sapphire King would next strike out against Rokan and the Iron Hands. For the record, the Iron Fathers are not the equivalent to captains, they sit on the Iron Council. If you want to think of an equivalent to other company commanders in other chapters, that would be the Iron Captains, who are, in fact, often Iron Fathers, but not always. And, of course, Iron Fathers can also be tech marines, librarians, chaplains, and the like. And they generally are of higher rank and influence. Clan Rokan were deployed on a major campaign against Orcs in the Mermidia system when they received a distress signal. It came from a ship in the nearby Colladian Gulf, claiming to be under attack from forces of Slanesh, swearing fealty to the Sapphire King. As the Orcs had, for the moment, at least been pushed back, a large portion of Clan Rokan under Ironfather Darmos travelled to investigate, but the ship was gone, with warp signatures leading to the Death World Scarvus. There the clan found and battled the Emperor's children, but the traitor force had both the advantage of numbers and the element of surprise and so whilst the Iron Hands reaped a great tally, they were almost wiped out in return with both of their attached Iron Fathers lost. Even worse, the Orcs and the Mermidia system rose up again, and though it may have been coincidence, some would argue that it wasn't. Whatever the case, when the survivors returned to Medusa, Clan Rokan was very much out of favour with the Iron Council. They were accused of abandoning their position against the Orcs, letting their anger cloud their judgement, and as such, they were censured heavily. The next commander of the company would be Iron Father Christos, a tech marine and a strict conservative disciplinarian whose first act was to ensure that any trace of the old Iron Fathers was wiped out, as tasked by the council. Replacing the Iron Captain of Rokan was just the start, and though it took many years, decades even, eventually Christos was ready to properly field test his improvements. Rokan had fought during this time, but only piecemeal and as support until Christos decided otherwise. The first major engagements of this new clan Rokan came against the Eldar of Craftworld Alatok on the Garden World Dawnbreak, and was a perfect demonstration of Christos's ways. The Iron Hands made a surgical strike against the Eldar to secure their main objective, a stronghold that had been formed from a dig site of ancient artifacts, and then they never left it. The calls for aid from the Katachan Imperial Guard forces went unanswered, as it was far more logical and suited their ways of war for Rokan not to pursue the Xenos into the jungles. Besides, if the planetary defenders and the guardsmen were too weak to survive alone, then they were not worthy of the Iron Hand's help anyway. Once they had extracted the artifacts that had been uncovered on Dawnbreak, the dig site for which had been the Eldar's base, Rokan simply left, abandoning the humans to their fate. With this done, the company was restored in the eyes of the chapter and returned to full frontline service. They continued to be cold, calculating and distant under Christos's command, a fact that came to a head during a campaign on the Forge World Columnus in Segmentum Solar. There they fought Orcs, but found that they were not the first Space Marines to arrive on the Forge World. Raven Guard, led by Shadow Captain Sten, had been engaged already with the Greenskins, gathering intel and buying time for the defenders. Perhaps surprisingly, or perhaps not, Christos decreed that the Iron Hands would not ally with the Raven Guard or even use their information believing either that they were capable of doing it alone, or that they would not gain anything from Alliance. Unfortunately for all concerned, this was not a regular war. This was the Weird War, led by a weird boy of immense psychic power that could deal incredible damage to even a Reaver Titan. Stripping its void shields and destroying its weapons in one go should tell you just how strong this orc was. The battles were intense and culminated in an all-out assault on the city of Erdry, a siege turned into near last stand as the weird boy teleported away an entire section of wall to force a breach. The Raven Guard sallied, but the Iron Hands did not join them, instead watching impassively as the entirety of Sten's forces were slain by the Orcs. Only when the last of Korax's sons fell did Christos give the order to engage, and though the Iron Hands dealt such a savage blow to the Greenskins that the war was effectively over from then on, even the Iron Council were left doubting the Tech Marine's judgement. In response to the battle on Columnus, a great debate was held within the Iron Hands. Whilst on the surface the Iron Council sought to investigate whether Christos had given into emotion in the battle, 
it became a much wider debate on the entire methodology and ethos of the chapter. The Christosian conclave, as it became known, rumbled on for over two centuries as every matter was debated in full detail, with the Iron Fathers being divided between Christos slash traditionalist supporters and those who challenged the revered tech marine, including the up-and-coming Cardan Stronos. Now many of you will know that name, for reasons that will become rather apparent later, but despite what would come for Stronos, he was on the losing side in the debate for the longest time as the Christosians gradually gained leverage. The conclave would never be truly resolved, however, as sometime around 460 M41, word came to the Iron Hands of Emperor's Children activity in the Gaudinia system, with evidence suggesting that these traitors worshipped the Sapphire King. In response, Christos gathered the assent of the Iron Council and led a force of over 800 Iron Hands to take them on. Bear in mind that's therefore over 80% of the entire chapter, just to show how seriously they took this. After discovering the first of the horrors the traitors had inflicted, Christos ordered a mass landing on Gaudinia Prime despite counsel from Stronos and others to wait and gather more information. The planet itself was mostly abandoned, and it was only when Rorkan led the mass assault on the primary manufactorum that the true fate of the populace was discovered. They had been literally fused with the technology, flesh and machine combined in a grotesque yet perfect manner and used to create demonic items. Nonetheless, there were still little to no enemies, until Christos stopped and the plans of the Sapphire King came to fruition. The demon had finally decided the time was right. The Iron Hands had purged the weakness of flesh and emotion enough that the Sapphire King believed it could destroy them with said emotions. Christos remarked to Rorkan's Iron Captain Gravar, also an Iron Father by this point, of the perfection of the flesh metal abominations, the efficiency of such a union, before driving his mechadendrites into some of the receptor ports. Within seconds, his body swelled and his bionics warped, fusing into his flesh as claws and tentacles replaced his limbs. I imagine a semi-mechanical chaos spawn crossed with an obliterator when I'm forced to visualise this, which I really don't like doing, so I'm going to stop. The scene repeated all across the Manufactorum, but it was only the Christosian Iron Fathers who succumbed before turning on their former brothers, with the Emperor's children and the demonic host arriving to join the slaughter. It wasn't just the Iron Fathers who fell into the demon's trap, however. Any Astartes who attempted to suppress his emotion with logic would eventually find himself succumbing to the corruption as well. It is unknown how many did fall, but it was several dozen from the ranks of Rorkan alone, so if the entire force had been present, it could well have been half the chapter. The entire company and then presumably the rest of the Iron Hands in turn, would have been doomed had Iron Father Stronos not had an epiphany. He realised the plan of the Sapphire King and rallied his brothers with a call to unleash their rage and vent their emotions. It was slow at first, but before long every brother of Rorkan was doing just that, battle cries screaming from their Vox Grills, and the demon realised the game was up. The Iron Hands would not be corrupted this time, and so they would simply have to die. The Chaos Host fought on, driving the Iron Hands back, and even with the words of Stronos and Armoured support, it appeared that Rorkan will still lose. It took a charge from their librarian, Epistolary Lidreek, to turn the tide, as the Psyche and his enraged brothers managed to attack and even destroy the physical form of the Sapphire King, causing the demons and the mutated Iron Hands to be destroyed in turn. With their leader and most of their allies now gone, the surviving Emperor's children fought and died gleefully to the last corrupted man, with the surviving members of Rorkan retreating to space along with the rest of the chapter before annihilating Gaudinia Prime from orbit. After the Gaudinian heresy, as the battles came to be known, the Iron Hands were shaken to the core. The Christosians had been those who followed the tenets of the Tempering the closest, and yet it had been they who had fallen victim to the manipulations of the Sapphire King. I will spare you the details of the arguments that ensued, but it was all resolved after a fashion by none other than Cardan Stronos, who delivered a passionate speech to the rest of the Iron Council using his real voice. The Council almost always spoke in binary or some other form of technolinguist, so this itself was pretty damn rare. That helped inspire slow and steady change in the Iron Hands. More librarians and chaplains were elevated to the rank of Iron Father, and the inhumanity of the chapter began to recede. Logic still ruled, but emotion and wrath were now permitted and utilised to a greater extent, with the comparison being made between a soul and the reactor of a machine. Rokan flourished under this new style of warfare, 
their angry edge being allowed to prosper as far as the new order would allow. They became the company at the head of the Iron Hand's new conquests, fighting on huge numbers of fields against a variety of enemies. Tyranids, orcs, and even the forces of chaos were broken by the anvil of Rorkan's defence or the hammer of their assaults, led by up to four Iron Fathers, including the now chief librarian, Lidreek. Even Cardan Stronos, serving as the leader of the Iron Council by vote every year post Gaudinia and thus the de facto chapter master, has joined his third company in their conquests, leading them in the battle for the hive world Bromok. This perhaps was the best example we know to show the changes in Rokan and the Iron Hands in recent times, compared to the engagement at Dawnbreak that we discussed earlier. On Bromok, the enemy is believed to be Necrons, though seemingly before the attack on Sanctuary 101 when the first recorded Necron battle took place, but the main difference was in the treatment of civilians and other human forces. Rather than simply abandon the defenders to their fates and focus on the enemy slash objective, Stronos assigned a squad and Rorkan's Iron Chaplain Shulgar to oversee and assist with the evacuation, only withdrawing this aid when the chance of recovering survivors fell below an agreed percentage, I believe 20. Thus, the Necrons, or whatever they were, were vanquished, though Bromok was potentially irreversibly damaged in the process, and millions of lives were saved as well. Clan Rokan has now become one of the foremost of the Iron Hand's clan companies, natural aggression fused with logic and intellect. Some detractors may whisper that they and Stronas are bordering on that edge of emotion that undid Ferris Manus 10,000 years ago, but none can deny their successes on the field of battle. We may never know if Clan Rokan's new approach will be the salvation or destruction of the Iron Hands, but as the grand calculation to determine the path of the chapter continues, they nonetheless fight to restore their Primarch's lost honour and defend the Imperium from its endless enemies. So ends the tale of Clan Rokan. A history of at least 10,000 years is rather hard to condense, not to mention anything they may have done pre-heresy but I hope you enjoyed the tale of one of the great clan companies of the Iron Hands. Their bonds to the machine are of course strong, but their emotion and anger mark them out from their calculating brothers and will hopefully provide the template for the rest of the chapter in future. The best of luck to Cardan Stronos and the other reformers, but even we know that a soulless machine driven on calculus alone is nothing compared to sentience. Just look at our drones. True, if somewhat rudimentary AI fighting for the greater good. Speaking of, I need to stop by the main empire next time I get a chance. That new XV-46 looks like it could be very useful. Job for another day. For now, we have a Legion world to visit, home to a force that hold a special place in the hearts and minds of Clan Rokan and their brothers. I hope you can join me for that next time. Prepare your stomachs. For now, thank you all for watching. My name is Michael for Tactica Imperialis, and I will see you all again. Goodbye.